So let's talk a little bit about the history of deep learning and ConvNets. So where did like the modern class of ConvNets start? Well, it, in 2012, we had ImageNet since 2009, roughly. Now what's ImageNet? Before that, we had these simplistic data set, things like MNIST, but ImageNet was really big. It was greater than a million images, uh, they came in 1,000 categories, and there had been a lot of activity of people using cl classical machine learning approaches, such as SIFT filters. So pre-AlexNet, state-of-the-art was at about 30% correct here. And then, look what happened. In 2012, AlexNet came out. AlexNet went down from 30% uh, errors to about 16%. And then we see very quickly how year over year deep learning got better at it, with say VGG in 2014 bringing it down to 7% error rate, Google Net bringing it to 6.7, and ultimately ResNet bringing it to 3.6 roughly, which is better than humans, which are at roughly 5% uh, error rate in that. Now see what happened is we had like image recognition data sets for a while and deep learning really revolutionized that. And this is the rebirth of the deep learning movement or like of the artificial neural network movement. It was incredibly unpopular pre-AlexNet. Once AlexNet came all of a sudden much of computer vision and later NLP and reinforcement learning moved away from the previous approaches to deep learning based approaches. So let's talk a little bit about AlexNet. It was uh, developed by Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskever. Now, uh, Ilya is now chief scientist as OpenAI. He was the inventor of sequence to sequence learning. And of course, Jeff Hinton was uh, an author on it, who was Alex's PhD supervisor. He co-invented Boltzmann machine and did all kinds of things. Arguably, Hinton might have been against it because Hinton very much believed that unsupervised learning was the future. Unsupervised learning still is the future. And arguably, unsupervised learning is the way people and babies and animals learn about the world. But in a way, AlexNet opened up this discovery that really just going supervised in a deep learning wise way was gonna, if you, the data sets are very big, going to be sufficient. So um, the problem that, uh, that AlexNet was applied to is compete on ImageNet, which was Feifei Li's data set of uh, roughly 14 million images with more than 20,000 categories, if we call, uh, consider all of them. For example, categories could be strawberry balloon or an example that you see on the, si on the left hand side, that's some kind of a monkey. See, I can't even positively identify which kind of a monkey it is. Let's briefly talk about Jeff Hinton because he's been so deeply influential on the deep learning field. He's an English-Canadian cognitive psychologist and computer scientist. Um, he popularized backpropagation and is seen as the godfather of deep learning. So he has been for many decades working towards making artificial neural networks really, uh, really work and solve real world problems. And he was also always into trying to understand how the brain does it and how human cognition relates to that. He co-invented Boltzmann machines, he contributed to AlexNet, and advised many of the top people in that area, including Jan LeCon, Elias Sutskever, Redford Neal, Brendan uh, and Frey, and works at Google uh, and U University of Toronto at the same time. He is one of the most important people in deep learning. That's why I thought it was important to talk a little bit about him here. So let's talk about AlexNet. AlexNet is a truly interesting architecture, in particular if you consider the space out of which it came. It had an amazing focus on engineering that many of the previous networks didn't have. So let's talk about what's going on. So here we have, we start with an image. You know, like the images in, Im uh, in ImageNet have 224 by 224 by 3. You know, like we have three channels 
and uh, because we have one for each color. Now at the first level, what, what they had is they had an 11 by 11 convolution kernel, which is huge by today's standards. We're using much smaller ones usually today. Okay, and now it had two graphics cards. Why did it have two graphics cards? Well, three gigabytes is too little in a way for really big networks at that time, and they were very limited in 2012. So what uh, what they did is they had like this, uh, they had one part of it which was running on one GPU, another part which was running on another GPU. Now mind you, that means that there's different features on different uh, on on the different graphics cards, no? Like uh, like some of the features are here, some of the channels are here, some of the channels are here, and now of course we need some interaction which is allowed, for example, here. And suddenly in the fully connected layers towards the end, there's a lot of those, but otherwise a lot of the communication is local on the graphics cards, which allowed it to run relatively fast. Okay, so we basically take that input image which is given to both the graphics cards. Now what do the graphics uh, uh, what do we have here? We uh, we have the convolution with a stride of 4. And then we have a max pool here of uh, of a stride 2. Now interestingly at this top level here they used a stride of 4. And that is why they go down from 224 to 55 as dimensions. And um, uh, but and at the same time, see like they go from 3 to 48 features here at that, same, uh, at that first level. Now as they go down from 55 to 27, which is a factor of 4, they go from 50 to 128 channels. Then here there's another max pool layer and they ultimately go to 192 channels. And they have some local response normalization. Um, and then it goes through uh, a last max pooling stage here, and then we have two layers of fully connected networks in between and a softmax cost function at the end. All the commands that you'd need for that you should have seen by now. So now, during AlexNet, they did a whole bunch of things that really helped. It was a wonderful piece of engineering. So the first one is this finding that ReLU converges much, much faster than Tench. Look, here we have a combination training error rate as a function of the epoch here. And in dashed, we see Tench. In solid, we see ReLU. ReLU works much better. The second one is they used dropout, where instead of training the network always fully connected, they randomly turn off certain units which makes the network more stable in a number of ways and more resilient in a way. Then here's a really interesting thing. They separated these two filters and keep in mind that there's more interactions within the same fault, uh, filter bank, the same graphics card than across them. And so that generally gives rise to specialization where you have a lot of color tuning in one of the graphics cards. In a way, it specializes on parsing and interpreting color and a lot of form tuning in the other one, which focuses on form, which is interesting because it's somewhat similar to the way uh, neurons in the brain are divided into different regions. And now the results were it really smoked the competition. 15% top five error, runner up had 26.2 that, uh, that year. Um, it was one of the first neural networks trained with GPU on CUDA, um, and um, it, it, it had 60 million parameters, which was a very big network at that time. And of course, it shaped the field, it started the rebirth of neural networks, and it has been an incredibly influential paper. And um, uh, so it's time for you to learn a little bit uh, about AlexNet. Uh, we will ask you how you think we could improve confidence and a little bit more about parameter efficiency and you get to run AlexNet and think a little bit about how it works.